Or he can get into that lane with comfort with usually means really good things for EDG in that early game. Yeah, and I want to touch on the Twisted Fate for a moment as well, because both of these respective mid laners played it during their playoffs, and I actually love the way AHQ played a fairly global comp. They had Rek'Sai in the jungle, and they had uh, TP Hecarim top laner, and they just made so many ganks into Anne's lane over and over and over, and executed really, yep. really well. The, the scary map pressure that that type of comp offers you is available, but it has just been taken off the table. See bands as well. Mako not getting that Annie. Don't think it's anything he's going to be seeing this tournament. We saw that happen all the way through the LPL once he started on that support. I, I can't believe that AHQ banned Rek'Sai over Sejuani in this game. I, I know that Rek'Sai has good early games, but Clear Love's ultimates on Sejuani yeah. are ridiculously good right here. Maybe they're trading it for the Callista pick because that's a heavily banned champion worldwide. But man, that's that's a terrifying thing to give up. Very quickly focusing that Callista for Anne. He did have a pentakill coming out of the league as they won it. So hopefully focus on him. He can bring that momentum into the game and he can go strong against Death this game. Be interesting if those lanes even match up. But it does get that Callista away from Death. Yeah, and just interesting priority. Yes, you are delaying, you know, the 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 Callista, but right. Sniff is still available. A lot of these other priority AD carries, allowing a team to get both Hecarim and Sejuani on the current patch, with the power that they offer, with the initiating tools, the flanking. This is League of Legends in hard mode. Yeah. If you're AHQ, but Death's Jinx is still left as well. If they decide to go with that type of composition, it could be very scary. We're already going to get Koro. Uh, yeah, Koro, sorry, I'm clear left for Hecarim there. It's and, going to be teleporting in with home guards. So. Nah, nah was available. So Koro favoring the Hecarim over the Nah, despite the fact that it, well, it wasn't banned out. Hecarim is banned true. so frequently. Sometimes yeah, we talk about true. these Nar players, they would be playing Hecarim if it's available. Uh, early on, EDG comes out with really good power picks right here. And they're picking well for the team fights as well already with Alistair and Sejuani. AHQ also has their own blend of things, stuff that they have played in the past. Yeah, and of course, Mountain's still playing Jarvan, even still. on the current patch. Um, one of his most played, especially during the playoffs. And Ziv, currently undefeated or not. He's got a 4-0 record throughout the course of their playoffs. He's going up against Koro's Hecarim. And again, it's just, it's, I mean, you, you see a mid-game team fight power from AHQ, yeah. but I'm just scared of all of that front line from EDG. Well, that Callista pickup along with the Jarvan definitely putting kind of a cancel on the Jinx if Def wanted to take it. Cannot get out of that Cataclysm Mountain likes to create. <laughs> Def getting the proposal, but it looks like he's actually going to go with the Urgot, something we definitely saw him playing over in the LPL quite often, one of his main AD carries. All right, and the main thing here is Pawns brought out a new pick here, Cassiopeia in the mid lane. Yeah. It's something that he should be able to play because Pawn can show that he plays everything, but it's a break from the backline assassin focused things that he has been playing in the mid lane. He also had to blind pick this into whatever Westor has. Westor hasn't really shown a difference from his old classic champions. Maybe we actually end up seeing a fizz here. Yeah, they've got the option available. The bigger question I have for HQ, how do they plan on burning through all of those tanks with the Callista damage and Gnar? Callista, yes, can do well, but I don't see her getting rid of a Hecarim, a Sejuani and Alistair and an Urgot with his shield and his ultimate down. There is so much beefiness for EDG to run rampant perfect, against AHQ. Perfect, perfect. Should have thought of the Karthus right here. Honestly, with these big balled up team fights, look at the short ranges on EDG. Right. That is three melee champions and an Urgot who swaps himself into the middle of things. If Westor can sit in the right spot on his Karthus, or if people can get trapped inside the Cataclysm with the Karthus in there, it is the pick for the team fight dragon focused game that we are probably going to end up seeing here. He bought out, he brought out Karthus in the 3 0 versus TPA, the 3 1 versus Yoey Flash Wolves in the finals, and now he's going to bring it out here at the midseason invitational. Doing quite well in those games. Karthus is definitely still something Westor likes to pick up. Definitely. The problem is it lost to Yoey Flash Wolves in that very first game. I didn't feel like AHQ were able to find the team fights that they necessarily needed or wanted. But this time round, with the uh, composition that yeah. EDG have, it should be a lot easier. Should being the operative word in that uh, uh, f uh, uh, statement. Yeah, woulda, coulda, shoulda could be the names <laughs> that a lot of people start saying after this one. Uh, this is now our first look of the final two teams that are at MSI. After this game, we will have seen everyone have their first go at it. That's right. Honestly, while EDG did pick up a lot of beef early on, 
AHQ has picked up a lot of stuff that can just sit in that beef and hopefully marinate a little bit and finish them <laughs> off. We'll see what can be served up for us. Once again, we'll be looking to Twitter to see how you think this game will go. Tweet hashtag EDG win or hashtag AHQ win to at LOL Esports. As usual, we'll tally those up and get the vote halfway through the game or somewhere in there. We definitely saw a lot of votes coming up for Besiktas last time. That fan base, very, very big. We'll see whose fans are standing behind them here as EDG takes on AHQ for our third game of the day here at the Midseason Invitational. A lot of eyes on this Karthus pick. As we said, it didn't work in the finals. It did in the previous rounds. That's right. And AHQ, they ran that uh, gauntlet as it were. Fourth, they beat the third seed. They beat the second seed. They beat the first seed. And I think the analyst desk also touched on the story that AHQ had an underwhelming regular season and overwhelming playoffs. EDG, the opposite. Overwhelming regular and very... Lackluster final. Let's see who will be channeling which performance in their opening game. Yeah, so a five man invade from AHQ. They're trying to get the deep wards in, but it's a blind five man invade. So they have no wards on their backside, which basically means EDG can get easy wards into the jungle of AHQ for doing this. Another thing we have to note Coral picking up the smite on Hecram against Dinar. If that were to be a straight up 1v1 matchup, because the smite early on giving fewer combat summoners, the Hecarim and Coral would actually be pushed back fairly easily by Zib. So maybe we end up seeing a little bit of double jungling for EDG or just a more reserved early laning phase from Coral. Minions have spawned. Well, for the time being, Coral currently sitting around that wolf camp. May be kicking that one off. Lane swap not actually being initiated just yet. Yeah, here's the thing, even though AHQ was able to place those deep wards. Mako and Deft had actually already ran through the lane. Right. So those wards didn't see anybody for AHQ. They have no way of predicting this because no one walked through the lane swap ward that it was intended for the scouting. Looks like we're going to get shared jungle camp on the Krug's top side coming out of Ziv and Mountain, but it's a one and one camp here. It's gonna be Clear Love taking his own and Koro as well. We'll see how this approaches the lane if they can get there to use that level two. We did see that uh, Maiko was freezing that lane in the bottom. So Anne mm -hmm. and Albus with the information and the early Gromp camp. So let's see if they do get to that level two and what they can do against it. It's just gonna be quite difficult against the very beefy Urgot, Allison. I think you can see Mako and Def both sort of respecting the range of their opponents, backing off, knowing level two's on the way. Level two, ridiculously important for both of these combos. If you do not respect the Kalista Thrash level two, you will die. Uh, at this point, EDG kind of called the lane swap improperly. They probably would have done both Krugs so they could match the Gromp that AHQ did, but because they only did one Krug and then froze the lane, they had to concede that bottom lane level two power spike to AHQ and therefore give Anne and Albus control of the lane. Gotta feel good for AHQ here. Those first two picks were Anne and Albus's Thrash and Kalista. So to get that in a nice strong lane early is going to keep the momentum up for them. Pawn now trading in the mid lane. As you can see, their stats a bit higher for Westor in that, but the kill participation from Pawn, a little more grisly. Mountain going for a gank, no flash possible on Coral. There they go! He gets a knockup. Coral's in trouble, continuing to run away. Remember, there's no oh. summoner, and the boomerang's not enough. Mountain and Ziv unable to get the killing blow. If Ziv had been able to poke down Coral a little bit more, the idea of that gank was sound, but Coral had an experience edge. He was healing up just enough for the minion wave, and he survives a very bold gank there by Mountain, flashing in behind the turret. Yeah, cloth armor definitely helping out yeah. that one. We do see the death sentence connecting on Maiko. But minion wave just under the tower, and Deft gonna have some free time to farm. Great little play there by Coro to stay in the lane and soak up those minions, even though he got pushed out still higher than Ziv in that situation. Back to the mid here, 25 to 21. Pawn looking to get in the face of Westor just a little bit with those miasmas to keep him out of range. Yeah, I, I still love the idea of Mountains early game on the oh, yeah. smiteless Hecarim. So infrequently do you see a smite, a flashless top laner punished by early ganks because very frequently you end up lane swapping that. 
EDG bold enough to lane that 1v1, and Koro doesn't actually get punished for it. I just really like the idea of the gank. Because the gank burned the flash and still wasn't successful and Koro was able to stay in lane, it's actually to huge benefit for EDG. Oh, clear love picking up the Scuttle Crab in the do -si do in the river here with Mountain. Could be heading down towards the bottom lane. Doesn't look like they have too much awareness, but they're just going to keep it safe. No pressure there as both junglers are going to be on the bottom side. Keep an eye on those CS numbers as they do continue to progress through this very standard laning phase. This sentence goes wide. Clearly, maybe expecting a gank hanging out just yeah. behind the wall. The threat of the lantern from Albus is very scary. And nice Albus, jump. that is caught out. They're going in for more, but they've turned. It's going to be Mountain as well coming into this fight. Can he get over the wall? He wants to use it to actually pop somebody up, so he's waiting, and he may just let him walk out. Death very low on mana. He's the one to get grabbed. Forces the flash out. Oh, he's under death. He's chugging the potion, but it's the hit coming in from Albus, and they keep going for clear love, but get knocked up by Mako. Now here comes Pawn. He's instantly exhausted. AHQ fighting a battle on two fronts and looking for Pawn, but it's Mako that's in trouble. He will get turned into beef steak as Mountain as well as Westall combo. AHQ with the first two kills. Back and forth and back again right there. AHQ with those two kills. Tremendous timing by Mountain coming over that wall. Specifically the split focus between EDG trying to lay a trap for the Kalista, but then the presence of mind by Albus to hold onto his lantern even while he was going to be someone getting aggressed on and throwing it to An is the reason they were able to reconfigure, group up, and win that. Additionally, yeah. somehow, despite Pawn pushing in the turret all that time, Westor beat him to the fight, and that's another big turning point there. Now the window is also open for that Karthus ultimate to come in, something AHQ, or rather, I'm sorry, EDG has to be aware of when they're fighting around it or within that window. We have to see what Westor can do. Down a little bit of CS thanks to that previous run, but the kill more than makes up for it. Even Stevens across the board as far as CS Yo. is concerned. EDG can I have to bounce back. Bounce with no early pressure. And again, that Jarvan, there's very few players still playing Jarvan at 5.7. Yep. But it seems to work for him. His damage is going to fall off. The early game is going to be the same as it ever was for Jarvan. In fact, maybe even a little bit easier because if, if we think all the way back to when the center hall patch actually happened, uh, there was only 5 AD taken off of Warrior, the patch beforehand, and the jungle camps actually started doing less damage. So the early game impact of a Jarvan before he completes his first major jungle item is actually better than it was when Jarvan was in meta. Right. So therefore, Mountain can still go around and make those early plays. Two successful ganks. When he completes his Cinder Hulk, it will be a much different Jarvan than the warrior Jarvan we used to see, who could take 60% of an 80s carry health <laughs> with a combo. This is more about controlling team fights, setting up walls for Gnar to Gnar people into, or for Westar to AoE team fights. It's very heavily reliant on him actually getting ahead so the other team doesn't get the damage to break through the Cinder Hulk Jarvan when he's in the team fights. Well, two assists in that early team fight. A step in the right direction as far as AHQ and Mountain are concerned. That thousand gold lead playing into the favor. We're getting close to the 10 minute mark. And Westall as well as Mountain are traditionally down in CS against their opponents. Mountain down seven, Westall normally down 15. Right. He's only seven at the moment with a couple of minutes to go. So doing better than his regional playoffs as far as CS is concerned. They mentioned on the analyst desk, AHQ falls behind in that early game. This time they're making up for it in kills. In the laning phase, maybe going towards ADG, but they're keeping it. The greatest strength, the greatest strength of AHQ as a team is their team fighting ability. Yeah. And the fact that Mountain, it's one of the reasons Mountain still plays Jarvan is because he tries to get them to that team fighting through some early game pressure. And they've been able to do that here because they were able to beat clear left to a gank, now it becomes about this dragon. Yeah, and you know, again, Analyst Desk alluded to it. Across all the teams in the tournament, AHQ have the earliest first dragon time yep. on average. In comparison, we're about to hit that time when they traditionally secure their first drake. There's not a whole lot of vision in the area, and it's actually EDG, I feel, who have slightly better wards, but we'll see what AHQ can do with that. And we also have to see how AHQ can deal with or use Westor's Requiem at this point right. in the game. Any gank or any skirmish that happens anywhere outside the mid lane can be added to by the Karthus. That's actually interesting here. Pawn pushed out the mid lane so heavily, and he might actually tilt the scale seal by being a mid laner. Ganking bot. 
Interesting roam. Slow movement by him. It looks like he's actually called this, <clears throat> called this one off, but maybe waiting for Clear Love in turn. They kind of cross paths here. Mountain also may get this ward to spot out Clear Love. At this point, Pawn wasted so much time on the roam. He has yeah. to get back to wave management. And now it becomes more about the dragon. Remember, a Sejuani at level six is a terrifying thing if he can land that glacial prison. Whoa! Oh, right. That's a massive Onto cataclysm. Death. The Requiem coming down. That's the window they need to not fight in. But AHQ is going to make it happen, and EDD starts to answer very nicely. The home no. guard teleport coming in. Actually, it's not on the home guard, but the teleport works for Koro. Ziv's a bit too big to keep going on. They should be able to finalize this one out. Koro gets the smite. They're going to transfer this one over to Pawn. Actually, Koro gets it in the end and a four for two in favor of EDG. And they were unable to burst someone at the start of that gank, which is why Clearlove had the time to come up through the lane, land the ultimate, and turn that fight around. Additionally, this time, Pawn beat Westar to the roam. Teleports came in at exactly the same time, but at the end of the day, the cluster favors EDG because yeah. they were the ones that didn't get bursted out early. Instantly evening out the scales, EDG Managing to balance out the goal. There's the yeah. fight again, Jeff. So, one thing, Mountain commits so hard, he uses EQ for no damage but for distance. Therefore, he can't get the burst. Then, beautiful dash ult by Clearlove. Watch the teleports come in. The Hecarim basically jumps in as Ziv nard them into the wall. So the follow was a little bit late. Total chaos, and it probably would have been a three for two, if not for Pawn roaming down there at the end to pick up Ziv. That was an amazing flash by Mako. He put himself, will you say, goal side to the Fate's Call. That's how Deft flashed out of the Cataclysm, because right. Mako got popped, not Deft. Very fast thinking by Mako to flash inside the Cataclysm to save his AD carry. Well played indeed. EDG's team fighting, giving them the advantage, in fact, as again, both junglers have moved into this Dragon Pit to clear out the vision several times. It's actually Clearlove that started this, but he did walk straight over an AHQ ward. He's actually going to back away. Because I think he yeah. spotted Mountain as well. You you can feel both teams want to get their hands on this dragon. And Absolutely. They're looking, looking to see if they can find a crack in their opponent's armor to go for that objective. Well, right now that teleport of Koro is down. It may be something very helpful if they can get number priorities on the bottom side of this map. But right yeah. now we still have quite an even dual lane in the bot, so it's not really decided. Yeah, and that even, you know, laning phase at 12 minutes is, is favoring Koro. He's yep, farming absolutely. up the head of, of Zev. He's got kills, he's got time, and he's scaling quite well. Everything is moving down bottom lane this match as well. Clear Love has been living down here, and it, it makes the teleport smite top lane are almost impossible to punish at this point because we know the dragon is such a high priority. So Koro should be able to basically free farm, and it, it makes it it makes it really difficult for either of these bottom lanes to commit because there is so much pressure from both sides being dictated onto that bottom lane. Yeah. And the next person who slips up is going to forfeit the dragon. And I feel like this is smart play from EDG because if you go back and watch AHQ's playoff run, a lot of their ganks is focused around Anne. Anne is, is probably the primary carry in terms of helping them win games. Westall is the star, but it's Anne that does a lot of the groundwork and the actual heavy lifting. And you constantly see Mountain going into that lane. Yep. Constantly seen cranked. When Westall was in TF, he was going down to the lane. And you can see in Clear Lab's positioning, Pawn's positioning, they're waiting for that fight just out of sight. Hopefully it doesn't backfire them for them with them going in the bottom lane so much. The kills have gone onto Westor and Ziv. Not too bad. Still going to get pressure out of them. And three assists to Anne and Albus. Full kill participation from Mountain as he keeps himself omnipresent in this game. And we have to note that pink ward down in the bottom lane. It has existed for about four minutes there because EDG hasn't pushed through the lane far enough to clear that ward. It's another reason Clearlove keeps seeing these mini opportunities in that bottom lane because he knows that AHQ is relatively pushed. It's just a matter of actually getting ward control on that river so he can take an appropriate route for Woo. Animal Brawl in the top lane. It does not look like these guys are using wet noodles this time. They are throwing some hard punches left and right, and Ziv got a very nice Gnar bar on that one. Mega Gnar was just what he needed. Definitely working in his favor. And I think yeah. some props to AHQ as far as their laning is concerned. Good CS numbers in their top and mid lane, and just marginally behind Def, but he does have a wave and a half, two waves there to, to farm up. So keeping himself relevant as far as that's concerned, which is also something, you know, we mentioned how Westall Mountain do fall behind traditionally. 
but they're keeping themselves up this time. I'm just worried about the scaling that EDG does have in their favor. Yeah, this is an EDG-like game. Here we go, gank on Albus. Thrown right into the fire. Oh, Big oh, oh. Quite a bit used there. And a save. I don't know why Albus flashed. He definitely wanted the for sure safety there, but EDG is going to have some good pressure now. It was an dragon. Alistair flash burn, but they burn all of Thresh's health bar as well as the Fates call. So a bit of a dangerous dragon for HQ can, HQ to contest. But Speed trying on depth. He wants to swap. Oh, he's going to get the swap. Mako knocks him up. Oh. Can he get to the left? Oh. No, because he's knocked away from it. It's not over yet as the teleports come in for more action. Deft cuts him down. He wants more body parts to attach to that Urgot. Mountain now onto depth. This didn't work last time, and Mountain's actually forced to Flash out, Siv doing some work on the backside, but he was really being peeled by Mako as EDG starts to scramble and find the members of AHQ. One for two. AHQ absolutely One steep for three, rolled. sorry. Like moths to a... What is it, a moth flame, killer? Flame. What do you call it? Moth to a flame. <laughs> a bad idea right there because they'd already lost so much, but they're attracted to that dragon. EDG knew it. There was the speed shine right there. A disaster for AHQ and a nice play by EDG. AHQ always fights around dragons. It's one of the things that they consistently do. They want to go for it. They want that objective. And this time around, it cost them. That's the second big team fight in a row that EDG have just simply outclassed them. Absolutely yeah. amazing. I mean, look, first off, Thresh is super low. Death uses the position reverser to get in range Ooh. to kill the Thresh, which is beautiful. Then Mako pushes and away from the Lantern, which was going to disappear anyway since Death was doing his job too. At this point, HQ's already committed, so they're they're trapped in the fight since they ended up teleporting down. One of those times where you actually have to concede first dragon because EDG was in yeah. clear position to win that with speed tried control as well as the pre-fight poke. All that pressure from AHQ in the bottom lane, and now Deft has two kills after those fights. They put so much on him, they tried not to let that Urgot get going, and now he has his two kills. Remember, if you want your voice heard, add that hashtag to your tweets on social media as you get through. We got some good games going on, and they're only setting the bar higher here as we are now in a game three. Well, Koro's Hecarim, 301. He's got a Cinder Hole completed, got a Glacier Shroud picked up. He's already terrifying and tanky, and the Lab is looking oh. for more fight, but we did see Mountain just off the side of the screen. Everything is about this bottom lane. Everything. Why not? Always. Why not? Basically, mid lane is a farm off right here between Pawn and Westor. Westor is almost always conceding turret pressure to Pawn, so unless Mountain was going to gank Pawn, there's no reason for Clear Love to go elsewhere right now. He knows Koro is free farming and will outscale at this point. And here we go. Maybe if Clear Love would have been there, the one time he's not. Requiem window coming in. Can they make the nightmare? And they do for Deft. Mako's now going to have a tough time getting out of this, but we got a double rotation down Clear Love as well as Pawn is going to stop that fight. This time, Mountain used the Lantern for distance and the EQ combo for the damage, which allowed him to dunk down Deft. Yeah. And they did find that window where Clear Love wasn't actually bottom lane, so they're able to get something back. This is still a game yet. Yeah, very important for AHQ. They should secure this tower as well. Albus playing defensive on the back line. I'm just trying to deny as many minions as possible. And I think all of that focus on bottom lane, all of that pressure, one momentary lapse, one momentary mistake, and all of a sudden HQ get the kills and the tower. Koro and Ziv continue Ooh. to trade aggressively in this top lane. Very, very aggressively. Even with that skirmisher is not really able to do much against Ziv here as he keeps pressuring it in a 3-0-1 Koro, however. We have not seen the implications of his home guard teleport in this game. Could be very big. And Requiem's catching EDG off guard. When will the Hecarim Onslaught of Shadows home guard catch HQ off guard? There's going to be two very powerful top laners in this game. Mm -hmm. It's. I really want to see how hard Koro is to kill with those three kills. Plus the Cinder Hulk early, especially when he's able to complete these next two items he's going to be working on. He's probably working on Frozen Heart and Spirit Visage as his next two. Those, those big three tank items for Hecarim make him an absolute menace, which Callista, while Callista's a great AD carry, does have a hard time working through some hyper tanks, which is what Sejuani and Hecarim may end up becoming this, this game. It's that EDG late game scaling we may end up keep talking about, but they are in position to create some very tanky fights. Yeah, I'm very interested to see how and wants to handle that front line with that attack speed dagger. If he goes the traditional BT into Hurricane, it's going to take a lot of those spears to rend away EDG's tank line. But 20 minutes on the clock will be when Baron spawns, and that's important for EDG because they are 
the mid game Baron oh. team. And that's a good knob backwards. Koro, even under turret shots, but still has his onslaught of shadows if he needed it. Not this time, though. Healing up, not too much of a problem for him, but a little bit of a funny play coming in. Those guys are on their own island in the top lane for quite some time here, both with three kills, so they want to see who can punch harder right now. 30,000 gold pretty much across the board, as you say, Trevor, even Stevens as EDG looks to even up the turrets as well. And without West or anywhere nearby, there's not a lot of wave clear or safe wave clear against that sort of front line. All gold lead, thanks to the CS and extra kill in their back pocket. Yeah, considering this game is going to be so teamfight focused as well, I'm a little bit surprised by Clear Love Spectre's Cal there on Sejuani. Going Aegis into Locket, I think, would have been much more well advised, especially considering EDG is going to be a big ball of tanks in teamfights, sitting in Karthus to file if things go well for Westor. Basically, by not going the Aegis, they put a much higher priority on getting Karthus out of fights. So, assuming they know what's up here, Mako should be headbutting Westor out of team fights near deaths, or they should be really, really being careful not to stay around in that Karthus defile. A lot of pressure then on Mako to make the right call. But we've had a 21 minute laning phase with multiple repeat ganks yeah. down into the bottom lane. I think yeah. we're in for a another long period of play because Dragon is only up in 30 seconds. That's Dragon number two at 21 minutes. And for a team like AHQ who do traditionally put a lot of emphasis on that objective, this is, is not what they're used to doing. EDG on the other hand, they're not really the five Dragon team. Well again, they get the crab right before the Dragon. That's exactly when you want to take it so they can now try and speed Shrine off to get the swap or an Alistair initiation yep. like they did last time. The river belongs to EDG for the most part. Top lane did go down. Top laner teleport timers have been pretty much identical this entire time. HQ has to be incredibly careful not to get poked down before the fight like they did last time because they do not want to go down two Dragons to zero. The intentions of EDG were to definitely take a fast fight. You could see Koro trying to hatch his home guards on the base, but he finally left to clear this top wave and pressure that top turret once again. Maybe they can get Ziv into a bad spot on entering this fight. Mid, also very close to going down here. EDG, quite a bit of options. There's a lot of options for both teams, and neither of them actually made a committed move towards that dragon yet. I think the fact that the mid tower is so low yeah. gives them the opportunity, but look at AHQ from the side. Can Albus get a death sentence? The answer will be no. It's a lot of damage, too. Again, Albus is going to be starting this next fight at very low health. Whether it's the Dragon or the mid lane, EDG now has two points with which to take advantages off of. And look at the minimap. Koro is already in the mid lane. Ziv trying to make his way down, but Meganar's active. That's a smite down onto Westor, and the exhaust is replied. They're trying to get him down. EDG is on the dragon right now, grabbed by Clear Love. Koro gets out on that one. Whoa! Oh, and misses and gets immediately swapped by Def to save it. He then goes into the fight. Mountain still with his ultimate up, but I think it's all disengaged from this time out for AHQ. There's the Fate's call. He's back in! The game, but it missed! It completely missed! And AHQ actually still wants it! It's one of those super. Super tank fights that we keep talking about. Death running low on mana, has down in the bottom lane, oh. and has got a kill onto Mako. Oh, but here comes the power pony. Koro's got one, clear love with another. Mountain is in retreat, but it's not enough. Ziv goes down, and that's an EDG whitewash. The fight was so long, Koro got to play twice. He was the one that was initiated <laughs> on. He goes back, recalls, teleports in with home guard, and is the difference maker. Again, that fight was so scattered, but it was clear love Sejuani ultimate, and mainly the headiness of Koro to fight twice there. Ziv not using Mega Knight. It had procked already on the way to the fight, and I definitely want to hear Crumbs' opinion on this Hecarim versus not, considering how much he was discussing the yeah. top lane matches on the analyst desk, but EDG, 3,000 gold in the lead. One more time. Here's that fight again. Yeah, it begins and ends with Koro. Koro burns so much here. Keep in mind, EDG is actually leveraging this mid lane pressure by taking the dragon uncontested. Then, not only does he absorb that, he jukes around the EQ. Then, the fight just kind of breaks into chaos, back and forth and back again. It seems like HQ always wants to continue this fight. Nice juke, nice flash there by Pawn in order to get out. And HQ feels like they have something, but they're not paying attention to Clear Love's holding of the Sejuani ultimate. Ooh. Boom, oh. onto four, and there's a home guard teleport. The turning point, the first pick Sejuani, 
from Clearlove because of his ability to land ultimate after ultimate in team fights. And Koro, the beast he's been all year with the home guard TP. Holding it for so long on that glacial prison, the right decision by Clearlove. One of the junglers that actually a lot of people touting as the number one jungler yeah. at this tournament. Clearlove off to a great start. Look at all the vision around Baron. EDG starting to set up that zone of control and saying, we dare you to face check us and the support that it'll give to take down this top outer turret. It's the last one remaining for EDG to knock down before they go deeper into AHQ territory. Already even getting the chance to mitigate against that Requiem. A Banshee's Veil now for Clear Love. It's going to keep him quite protected. Seeing a lot of core items come out on the side of EDG now. They're kind of spiking them very hard. The Frozen Heart now finished for Koro as he's got that along with the Spirit Visage. And he's already been making the plays. 5-0-1 for him on that. It's incredibly difficult for AHQ to kill Koro at this point in the game. They, they have very few tools to do so. They have the two items on, and Westor is still working on his major near the large rod item. And EDG is just looking to get picks. And that's going to be Mountain trying to dive in. He's got a good collapse on the team, but it looks like EDG's able to assess this one just right. Westor very low, but in a great spot to defile damage. That's the knockup coming in. Can they get out? EDG, Ooh. oh, huge Whoa. damage from the Requiem, and that's going to give him enough time to not really living the fight. Actually, I am wrong. That is Ziv going down. I thought he was going to be able to take out Mako and turn to another one. But no, EDG micro in and out perfectly. AHQ will not have a more befitting fight right. for Karthus than that one. And they still were not able to finish them at that point. EDG with just enough gold lead to deal with all the damage that came through there. Koro, we said they were going to have a hard time killing him. He comes out of that fight with nearly full health after all of that chaos. And that is the difference right there. Westor did everything he could. AHQ had a beautiful NAR ultimate. Everything kind of went well for them, but EDG still comes out on top. And keep in mind, the first two picks by AHQ was Callista and Thresh, who are currently 147, 246. They gave up that Hecarim. It was available for them, and they opted not into it. There's that team fight again. Yeah, Teleport comes in as soon as Mountain begins to get picked off. Mountain still gets off a Cataclysm, and it. Pawn actually swapped himself to the wrong side of the wall right there uh, <laughs> because he was trying to create a nice pick. Of course, he swapped it and is able to die right there. But then, honestly, look at them sitting in that defile. It ended up being not quite enough. Well, not this time, Ryan. And as you touched on, Jet, Maiko actually did knock back Westor during the course of that fight. Blue buff picked up, I believe, who was that pawn. And AHQ looking for more. They're down 5,000 gold trying to set up a fight. And now the important thing is Mako has also completed the Locket of the Iron Solari. Yep. Solari. He started Kindle Gem, but now he's finished it right off. So not only do they get the Brute Manic Resistance, but they will also get the Shield from the Active. And they are in position to bully AHQ right now. Uh, the confidence they should have after that last team fight. So Trevor, you were saying a little hard to take down tanks. Got a little excited there, that front end burst, but that's all that AHQ has is that front end burst. There was no damage to follow up after that, and EDG was able to just walk around easy. If Anne is dead, right. there is no way to finish it off. Yes, the burst from Westo in a great position worked, but it just you need him to clean up, and unfortunately, a Callista is not a mega tank killer. Koro doesn't even care about the tower. <laughs> no need to, that guy is completely out of <laughs> so control big. right now. He has 12,000 gold, uh, which is 1,500 more than the next closest player in the game right now. That's including his own team. He gets a local gold as well as a global gold for that next turret. Absolutely crazy. EDG coming in with a fantastic composition. Pawn going for the Casio this game, playing it safer in the mid lane. 1-1-6. One, one, Mako gets an Alistar, plays very much like his Annie, and they can continue to fight the same way. And I think you have to take a step back and look at EDG's performance this game, much like we did earlier in the day with Fnatic. Contrast the team's performance versus their most recent local match. Of course, EDG did defeat LGD, I believe it was two weeks ago, if memory serves correctly. Yep. And they did not look this clean. They did not look this coordinated. The team fights are great. EDG on the right place. They they even countered AHQ's uh, favoritism and, and trend yep. to gank the bottom lane because Pawn rotated multiple times. Clearlove was available for counter ganks. It's intelligent, controlled, calculated from the number one Chinese squad. Yeah, when we were watching that series they had against LGD again a couple days back, it seemed like none of the fights EDG took were planned. It, it was mainly 
hey, someone was killing a pink ward, so everything ended up flying off. This time, EDG is making the plays like that flash ultimate from Pawn. And here comes Koro. Koro come flying in, not gonna have the home guard right away since it's tagged, but they do get a nice ultimate to continue the fight. Clear love just on the edge of Anne, but he's getting the kite back. He will eventually have to be caught out by this one. Dodges the Arctic Assault, but he wants to stay in the fight. How many arrows does he have in <laughs> Clear Love? Rend it! Takes about half his HP on that one, and EDG's trying to figure out who they want. Very scattered, very nice to get uh, the Karthus down outside of the fight, but they're not even afraid to fight in it. They are not. Anne is our final alive, but what are you going to do against those tanks? He hops over the wall. How is he still alive? Cheeky play. I mean, Anne is playing his heart out right now, but there's not much he can do outside of stacking a thousand arrows inside of Clear Love before rending because he was hitting <laughs> him for an eternity and he still couldn't even take him down. At that point, they lose two despite so much being bur burnt on Anne as he's kiting backwards. It was actually three dead. The fight went on for so long, Mountain ended up coming back. If ever you needed more proof that Callista cannot kill tanks, that was it. And had 20, 30 spears, I felt, <laughs> in clear love Sejuani, and it just but, was not but, but enough. But wound. Still has no last whisper is a critical thing right here. He has been pushed back because he could not pick up any kills in those crazy Absolutely. Fights. With last whisper now, he would have a slightly better chance, but it's still going to be a critless build, which is going to diminish his ability to cut through EDG's tanks at this point, and we, we draw back. That's all I can do. We draw back to the early game again. Even champion select, Callista Thresh immediately. Focus from Mountain in the bottom lane to help that, as well as Westor getting a few kills off Requiem. All of those were assists for Anne, not kills. We actually had our observers go back and double check. He had 15 spears in for that ranch. <laughs> Jeez. So that's, that's at least 15 auto attacks right there on a clear level, as well as the damage. No, couldn't get him. No, he couldn't, but Koro does find Anne. Anne's in trouble and he is down. Ooh. Westall gets caught by the Glacial Prison. He's in full retreat and EDG a running rampage of AHQ. Ziv not even close to getting a Gnar. They all have to scatter. A triple kill coming in now for Koro. The legendary horse, 10-0-6. And Deft is gonna finish off Albus just to boot on the fight. Ziv throwing out some wards to try and stop this, but it is just a grind now from EDG. They have figured out AHQ, and now they're going to be pressuring down with the Baron. Koro running away with this game. Absolutely. As is EDG. What Gary, a statement. Harry top laners are still here, guys. <laughs> Koro has been one. He is a monster of the top lane. I mean, just looking at this one, we talked about Anne needing 15 auto attacks to not even take down Sejuani. Koro takes oh. a swing at him and takes him below half health. KO. Another beautiful ultimate from Clear Love over the wall right here. Something about these team compositions that is very apparent. When both teams are, are fairly tanky and heavily melee focused, the team fights will be very cluttered. So these games do end up snowballing out of control since both teams are dedicated on just team fighting. EDG was able to win those team fights early, and now they are just hammering their advantage home again and again, and not allowing AHQ a time to recover by farming or picking to equalize the team fights, and they're just forcing team fight after team fight. Yeah, and regardless of the lead that EDG have built up now, this is one of the most definitive teams at closing a game out. Once they have that lead, they really know how to push down the final objectives. When we were in that replay, we did actually see, I believe, Diff stealing away the blue buff from AHQ. EDG just pushing out the waves. They've got great vision in the top half of the map. Baron empowered minions. There's only one inner turret there in that uh, top lane left to knock down. And EDG instantly group up. Koro doesn't have TP yet, but he's barreling down that mid lane with those home guard and Trinity Force. And their EDG is just so strong right now. Able to start surplusing these items. Another Banshee's Veil, three Frozen Hearts. Whoever Anne's trying to hit is going to be within that aura in these balled up fights. It is going to be even harder now. Things are only weighing against AHQ. Trying to guard this last second tier turret. They are going to have to catch a big mistake off of EDG to really claw back into this one. 14,000 gold down. They're doing what they can.
And just really nice resistance stacking by everyone on EDG as well. Everyone on their team, when they're right. in the range of the locket, has over 100 magic resistance. Uh, more on some people, so not even a Void Staff on West, or even if he sits in the middle, they're done. Goodbye, and the Insta Flash from Def AHQ now scattering. Despite that fantastic gnar, it's not going to be enough. Koro dives the back line of the Onslaught to Shadows, where Store is down. Requiem starts to get channeled, and here's the damage on EDG. Still, it's that end damage now, and not enough to keep them alive in the fight. It's really not even tickling EDG at this point as they have the base to themselves. They ace AHQ. They get a lead. They know how to hammer it home. They still have the Baron buff. That's a five for one. They're pushing on the Nexus. We oh, know Memphis. this is how EDG does it. Once they can go for Baron, they go for the win. It's almost a prerequisite to every one of their games, whether it's at 20 minutes or now at 34 minutes. 28 to 10. EDG come out strong with a 35 minute game over AHQ and Death sacrifices himself. What a fantastic win for EDG. A lot so of skirmishes. Risks. So few risks, though, on EDG's side. Yeah, measured early game, committing to fights very well, but not over committing to fights, which has been an Achilles heel of EDG in some situations. Mainly Clear Love just having that huge focus on the bot lane. Yeah. Because he knew Coral could deal with himself, and the teleports were greater for Coral than they were for Ziv. It was a battle of top laners teleporting down to join in team fights from eight minutes on into this game. Pawn pulled out a new AoE damage champion, not an assassin, which was ideal for these grouped up team fights, but it was mainly about a Coral Sacro. Yeah, and I also have to think AHQ, I feel like they played better than I had thought they would against EDG, and the problem for them was their shot calling this game. Mechanically, they played well. The lanes did not necessarily go terribly against them. Right. It was they they elected into team fights they should not have done. We also saw a massive difference once we got into the team fight phase between the Sejuani and the Jarvan, yeah. jungle pick wise. Yes, you can trap someone in a Cataclysm, but it was nothing compared to Clear Love's Four Sejuani man ultimates. ultimates again and again and again. Best team fighting jungler here, Clear Love, especially when he's on Sejuani. Brilliant play. And team fighting exactly, is exactly what we got out of this game. 38 kills in 35 minutes, exactly. These regions love to fight back and forth, and we got that. Also seeing, like you said, Pawn on Cassiopeia, a lot of players, even Fnatic, pulling out new stuff. Mm -hmm. What are you guys going to ban now? Who's going to be the best at kind of reorganizing mid-game? There's, mid there's five more games today. Now we see who support staff that's with them that's can help the teams adapt. We've seen everybody play once. Now it becomes fixing the problems that we have demonstrated or we've witnessed on this stage. Absolutely. And once again, we're going to now send it over to our analyst desk to get their thoughts about the match.